Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, celebrated American actor, D.B. Sweeney. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another episode of The Rich Redmond Show, the show where we talk about things like music, motivation, success. I'm talking to thought leaders, comedians, actors, all sorts of creative types. I'm coming to you from Midtown, off Music Row, Nashville. Jim is in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and today's guests from the outskirts of Chicago. Jim, I'm, you know, I always say I'm excited, but I'm excited, man. Like, really excited. This is a fellow friend of my buddy, Steve Cooper's. Um, he, <laughs> I mean, he's been a staple of theater and television and film for decades. You may know him from Francis Ford Coppola's Garden of Stone, the TV shows like House, Jericho, Castle, The Closer, 24, and much, much more. Today's guest, D.B. Sweeney. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. I hope I can oh, man. that pull up. This is a this is a, this is a pleasure, man. A real treat. Um, a working actor for decades, man. This is like um, it's like the dodo bird, man. It's like a rare thing. A working actor. Yeah, you know, I, when I went to NYU in the early '80s, I had I was a uh, had a bad knee. Baseball was over, and it was like, what am I going to do for the immediate future? But uh, you know, I thought I'd be an actor for two or three years. You know, I heard there was pretty girls, and you'd have to work hard, so. I just thought I'd just do that for a couple of years the way somebody goes to Europe with a backpack and then, you know, go to law school or, or you know, become some other kind of asshole and just get on with the rest of my life. And <laughs> one thing led to another. And, and like you say, 35 years now. So I'm very, very blessed and very grateful. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah, there's a there's a common theme with, I think, a lot of working actors. We, we chatted with uh, Paul Ben Victor yesterday. Have you guys been on some projects together? We have not. We have not. But I'm aware of him. He's very good. Yeah. We're, hey, and so originally you're from Long Island. That's right, Strong Island. That's where my Strong girlfriend's Island. from. Yeah, it's Strong Long Island. Island. Hey, yeah. and I used to sound like E on Entourage, and then I had an audition with uh, uh, what the heck was his name? Anyway, he's a very famous cast director. His name escapes me right now. Uh, big guy. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so he said to me, "Hey, DB, you don't look like you're from Long Island, so you can't sound like you're from Long Island." And I didn't really know what he meant at the time, but then. Several years later, many years later, they were cast in The Sopranos, and I was like, oh, I get it. They're never going to hire me to be in The Sopranos, so I got to sound like the guy from Banff, Alberta, or Iowa, or, you know, Utah. Like, and it was very good advice, and I took the advice even when I didn't understand it, but I, I got rid of my accent. How did you go about doing that? Yeah. Well, it's, it's actually a trick that I learned, and this is getting maybe a little too technical, but uh, you take the best thing is a wine cork. A cork! Yeah. A wine cork. And I would stand in my mirror uh, in my bathroom for an hour every morning and every night and read Shakespeare sonnets. Oh, just, wow. And just read them and try to make them as clear as I could with, uh, with the cork or the pen in my mouth. And, uh, you know, over time, I just uh, I started to be really aware of the way, you know, we all have our regionalisms, uh, where, sure. you know, and lazy parts of our speech. And I became aware of mine and I was able to get rid of it. And it gave me a real good knack for, you know, for doing some other accents. You know, I'm not like a Mel Blanc or anything, but I can do, you know, a few you know, English variation, Irish, Welsh, all those kinds of things. I've done on all those. So, um, so it's, 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 it's been a good skill. And I think it kind of ties into what you're saying about, you know, working actors and having longevity, you got to keep grinding and you got to keep developing new skills and, and try to find ways to make yourself hireable. Yeah. It uses uh, that technique. It's uh, it, I, I grew up in Danbury, Connecticut. So uh, I was surrounded by people from New York all the time and I got into radio and I became like one of the most prevalent voices on the radio station. But I noticed a lot of my region, you, when you hear them back is when you start really yeah. paying attention. And there was always this one spot I would do for a local nightclub called Tuxedo Junction. And I'd be like, coming up this Saturday night. <laughs> like, Saturday? I'm like, so I would overcompensate and go, Saturday. Right. Eventually yeah, I went through a phase like that, too. The yeah. word that got me was coffee. coffee. I, 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 oh. a cup of coffee. Come on. Come on. Dead oh, giveaway. Look at that for me. Come on. Dead but you know, the funny thing is, look at Gandolfini. He, he didn't speak like that at all. No. No, I actually saw Gandolfini on Broadway. Uh, he was with Alec Baldwin in Streetcar Named Desire way ah. back in the day. And that was like a big break for him then. 
And, uh, you know, he was playing a Southern guy. He was, you know, he was a very skilled actor. Yeah, he was. Wow. So you, you focused on that and kind of like cured yourself of it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I figured I, I didn't know anybody in show business, and I didn't know Lou DeJamo is the name of the casting director. Hey, um, we got it. Lou, just jumped in. That's happening hey, to me uh, too, man. I just yeah, and he. So anyway, so I, I it was sort of like I, I knew it was good advice, and I didn't know anybody in show business, and so anytime I had somebody give me advice that sounded good, I just tried to follow it because it, even as a teenager, one of my biggest pet peeves is like people who ask for your advice or your opinion and then ignore it. And I just, right. so I just, I've always tried to be like, Hey, if I'm going to take the trouble to ask for advice or get somebody's opinion, you know, I need to at least consider it and if not necessarily act on it. Yeah. Right. And, and so what, what was your, and what was the training that got you started as a, as a thespian? Well, I auditioned for NYU and, uh, it was, I didn't even know what a monologue was, but I prepared one. My sister was going to NYU. She was a year older than me, not in acting in uh, French literature and like she's oh, wow. really smart and and uh, intellectual type person. And, but I was sort of like, I, I don't really know where else I would go. I was at Tulane University in New Orleans when I got hurt. And, that, and I, like you said, I came from Long Island. So I went back home. My dad was a high school guidance counselor. He was like, you got to get your college degree or you'll be a failure in life. So I was like, I don't want to go to college. I just want to, you know, drink or, you know, go <laughs> ride a motorcycle. You know, I don't want And so, but I thought that acting was the compromise. So I heard, I learned about what these auditions were where you did a monologue. And so I took my favorite book at the time, The Catcher in the Rye. And there's oh, a man. chapter in there, and I don't know if this is a little deep trivia for you, but one of the reasons I took to that book is because Holden Caulfield's big brother, his name is DB, and he's a writer, and he's a really good writer, and Holden's mad at him because he went to Hollywood and became an asshole. So that's one of the reasons why I'm DB, because of that book. Anyway, I took this monologue where Holden talks about his other brother dies, in a, uh, he gets cancer and dies, and Holden uh, has a baseball glove and he breaks all the windows in the car because he's grieving. And it, so it's a, it's a really memorable part of the book. And I turned it into a monologue and I auditioned for NYU. And I guess, you know, the, the, the stupidity or the good fortune of being a novice kicked in and this guy, they let me in, they gave me some scholarship money. And, and so I thought, wow, oh, wow, I guess maybe I could be an actor. And then I, I started auditioning for the plays there and I didn't get any parts at all. Like I was so rough and unpolished and, um, but I really wanted to try and get better at it. And I thought, the acting classes weren't really helping me because I thought I could tell right away that most of the acting teachers were people that really did, couldn't make it. And they were just like financing their lack of ability to make it by teaching uh, other people. Yeah. And so I, that, that got clear really quick. And, you know, <laughs> some of these people, you know, Scott, school is expensive. And, and I'm just thinking, I can't just be listening to these idiots who couldn't get a job. So I found this room at NYU in, in Greenwich Village that was not being used. It was about you know, 100 by 100. And it was an empty space. And I went to the dean and I said, hey, can I use that room? I want to do a play with my friends. And so we got together. We figured out how to hang up the lights. We had like clip lights. And we put out 60 folding chairs and we did a play. And nobody came. You know, three people came, I think. But it was we oh. figured out some things. And then we did another play. And on the second play, I, I, I discovered this thing called Ross Reports, which was a little book you could buy at New York newsstands. It was a list of all the casting directors and all the agents and all the production companies in New York at the time. And you could buy it and they updated it every couple of months. And I was like, Oh, these are all the casting people. So every time we did a play, I would print out a flyer and, and get a headshot and slide it under the door with an invitation to this play at every casting director in New York. It was about 85 of them at the time. And agents. That's bold. That's bold, man. Yeah. So, I, but here's the thing. Uh, the, the thing that I think put it over the top is I didn't say come to this NYU student production the address of the building was 725 Broadway in, in Greenwich Village. So I just said, this a new production of uh, American Buffalo at the 725 Broadway Theater, New York, New York, please come. And then it was like an RSVP line, which was the dorm room phone. And, you know, so it was, it was pretty much very homemade. But we did that for two years. And, and on about the sixth play, this guy came in. And, you know, we always knew there would be 60 seats. And we never, our biggest crowd was four, I think, once we had four people. And so this one night, we had like seven people. And one of the guys was, uh, was an agent, and he signed me. Wow. So you're, the persistence paid off after six plays. Yeah, yeah. And I was learning how I was getting better. I was learning how to do it. And then nothing happened right away, but I started doing theater, like in the real world of, of Manhattan, you know, where you still didn't get any money. Like you sometimes they gave you, you know, token payment was a subway token in those days. <laughs> and uh, two subway tokens for performance. And so, you know, I just kept grinding at it and just trying to get better and better. And, uh, you know, then I had the good fortune of uh, getting hired to be in a Broadway play called The Kane Mutiny Court Martial. Wow. And, and uh, I heard about a stage manager friend of mine. I heard that somebody was leaving the play, so they weren't going to really have a big cast, and they were just bringing in like 10 guys. And the part had one line, one line only, 
but you had to understudy another part that had, you know, three or four pages. So they were hiring somebody based on their ability to play the understudy role. Yes. So, uh, you know, I just, I got that part and then I did that for six weeks and, uh, you know, one thing led to another. That's the, the way it works. Show, yeah. Sorry, the last week of the show, the guy who I was understudying left. Like, you know, when the plays are about to close, it's like rats leaving the sinking ship. People go off to their next job. So my good fortune was he left. And the last week of the show, I got to play that part seven times. Um, and my first performance was a Wednesday matinee, which is usually death because it's, uh, you know, it's all blue hairs. And people say, what did he say? I don't know. What's this thing about? You know, the audience, you know, that's the worst. The, the Wednesday matinees are the worst. But because it was the last week of the show, they made a free performance for all New York City high school kids. Oh, So I was like 21 years old, 22 years old. And I'm the scared guy in front of all the big Navy officers. So I killed. Like I went out there, killed. I got like applause on the way out of the stage, which nobody had ever gotten in that role. So the producer was like, oh, my God, that's unbelievable. And, you know, so, you know, it's one thing led to another. And it gave me confidence. And I, I was off and running. Man, you, yeah, you really built it. I mean, but there is that, st you said you were rough around the edges and you didn't have any experience. There's something to that when you're, when you're not overtrained, because I'm sure that you've experienced working with all different types of actors at different levels of their career. And some come in all meisner and Stanislavski and, and, and overeducated and, and, and Stanislavski, it's a hard one to get out. It's hard one. Um, uh, and it's then you really got the guys that just have a great feel and have a good understanding of it. How, I mean, cause I've been trying to, <laughs> Jim, you're nuts. I've been trying to, uh, to, to, you know, study acting for five years. And I'm swimming with the sharks. I mean, it's like when I when I take an acting class, it's not I'm with people that are full time lift drivers, baristas and waiters, and they are focused so heavily on that. So you rise to their level. You know, they want it so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Same, you know, one of the things I learned uh, early on was that you got to really get off book. And it sounds like so fundamental. Like it's like if I talk to young actors, you guys that are just starting out. It's like. It's like, you gotta be on time, number one. And on time means 15 minutes early. Mm -hmm. That's number one, because if they're looking for you, they can't be looking for you. They're already looking for Ben Affleck or whoever the lead female is. They've already got enough issues. They need you to be standing there ready to go. Like they can just turn you on and push you in. So that's number one. And then number two is you gotta know your lines. And I don't just mean kind of know your lines. I mean, know your lines so well that you don't even have to look at the page. The day that you wake up to do your scene, you know the lines so well, you don't have to look at it. Because yeah. that's really where the acting starts is when, when the, the lines are part of you because it's all the stuff you're doing. Because most people, when they don't really know their lines, they're struggling to get through that line on some level. Or they're struggling, struggling to find the next line or they're just insecure about it. And if you're an insecure character, that can work. But more often than not, you just look like somebody that doesn't know their lines. Yeah. If you really know your lines, you can behave and react. And so those two things, it's amazing. It knocks out 99% of the people that I work with where I, I see, okay, they're not serious. They don't know their lines. Yeah. So that's like step one. Now, what, now what, what is your process associated with that? Is it rep repetition? Do you remove the punctuation? Do you record it and listen to it back? Do you run lines with someone else? Well, it's always great if you can find somebody to run lines with. And when I, when I used to play, uh, I was living in California, I used to play a little tennis. And the best way to learn lines is either by shooting free throws together or hitting tennis balls together because then you, you take your mind off the line and it just becomes – built into your body a little bit better. Yeah. So, but I usually can't arrange that. So what I do is I write it out longhand Ooh. and I write all my lines in all capital letters. And then I write all the other guys' lines in all small letters. But the Q word, the last line in their line is in capital letters. And I always try to write it on a page where I, I, I like six, maybe I have six lines on a page and they have five. And then I'm, I'm just trying to, and if I have a three page scene, so I have six lines, five lines, six lines. And I want my brain to take a picture of that page. And, and so that if I get lost, I know it's, wait, I know I'm about two thirds of the way down the page. This is that long line where I say, uh, you know, uh, Maserati and, you know, and, and it just, it helps your brain, I think, to make it. So I guess the, the short answer is whatever you can do to make it visual and physical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause sometimes I see, we... I'll see actors like, and it looks like their eyes are up and they're like seeing it in their mind's eye and it still hasn't become muscle memory. So they're like searching it because they've taken a picture of the page in their mind and they're going through it. Like it's a dead giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> it works a lot on police shows. Like if you're a suspect and you're being interrogated, searching for your lines sometimes feels like you're searching for your story that you're trying to lie on law and order or whatever. So a lot of people get away with it in that genre, not really knowing their lines because it actually looks like decent acting. It's like, Oh wow, he's trying to figure out what he what the other guy said and what did you know? But no, he's just trying to learn his lines, you know. Totally. So you don't get that with voiceover; you just read right off the copy. 
Yeah. Voiceover is liberating in that they don't want you to ad lib, right? I mean, they want, they want to hear exactly every punctuation they wrote. I don't even correct mistakes anymore in auditions. I just, I, if there's a grammatical mistake, I just play it the way they have it and just, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. You give them alt- alternates and stuff like that? Nothing? Just whatever comes to mind? Sometimes I'll give them an alternate if I think of something great or I feel like if it's a loose script. But yeah. if it's like a, I don't know, if it's, if it's like a Fortune 500 company and this has gone through a lot of vetting, I'm yeah. like, you know what? I don't want to be the guy that's pointing out that this person should have taken English in college. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Where what were I, we, I, when, ahead, when, didn't we have a, we had an actor or we were talking to somebody that talked about uh, memorizing lines and I was, I completely lost my thought on this. So I completely, I'll come oh. back to me. Well, well, you know, I mean, my process on that is, is, is like, I was lucky enough, um, last year I got to do uh, a scene on a television show called Happy with Christopher Maloney, and I was the cop, and I got to beat the hell out of Christopher Maloney, but here I am out of all this squadron of cops, and I'm like, I'm acting with this probably Emmy Award winning actor who's been at it forever, and my thinking to myself, my goal is to just make, come out of this day, having Chris Maloney think that I'm a real working actor and not a drummer for the 35 years who just started acting. And it was great. It went great. But the night before, mm, I was just writing the, my lines out like over and over and over. And it worked out, man. I, I had them. You may have lost them when you said, you know, I'm going to paradiddle your ass into the <laughs> ground. <laughs> you know so what's it like uh, uh learning a song is that the similar process for, for learning lines for you <laughs> it's, it's well, like voiceover <laughs> well you know for me so i was like over educated like a classically trained percussionist so timpani marimba xylophone anything you could strike or beat or rattle and you know they make high art out of it so you get really good at like reading the written page and so now when i have to learn a song and i'm maybe only going to play it once I'll, I'll just write out a chart and then it's like like a little cheat chart and then I'll tape it like to the side of the Tom Tom or the side of the hi-hat stand and I could just kind of like catch the phrases it's almost like a cue card for an actor well there's a video that we put up on YouTube and I'll sing Rich's praises here it shows his entire system of how he hears a song maps it out and plays it back in one shot it's amazing to watch well, it's just survival of the fittest when you're a session musician or a session drummer. And, you know, there's a million other guys that have that skill set. So it's that same professionalism showing up early. Your stuff sounds good. You can take direction. You know your craft. And then you want, you know, I just feel like we're, I feel like sometimes in the arts, we're always bringing someone else's vision to life. And right. so really, it's like we're in the yes, sir, yes, ma'am business. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I mean, I don't know the right word to say a little, a little fill as a drummer, but as an actor, you, you put a little bit of a, just a little bit of special sauce on one line yeah. and otherwise they just want to hear their lines. They don't want, mm. they really don't want you to like improve them, even if you have a better idea. And that's been a struggle for me in on camera stuff because I, I've, I'm, I feel like I'm a good writer. I've written a couple movies and I've been rewriting my own dialogue now for the last 15 years with and without permission. But um, usually, you know, I usually always give them their version of their lines too, but I throw things in and, and so, but I do notice there are certain sets, especially, uh, well, sitcom, forget about it. They don't want any kind of ad libs, but even hour long cop shows and stuff like that, they get pissed off if you come up with something better than they came up with. So it's, it's almost like stay in your lane. You know, you don't want to, you know, and, if, and, and make it like, you know, hey, this is a really great line. And it, it's weird. It's like, they'd rather have me make their bad line work than make their bad line better. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's like yeah, Paul, ben, Paul, Ben, Victor was still talking about that. He's like, Hey, I'd like to ad lib. And, and they've been, you know, the, the cast and crew, the director's like, yeah, this is cool. And then the writer will be like, can you do it one time as written? Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. sure would appreciate that. I love doing the sitcom scenes because there's such a science to that, like right hook, right hook, left, like the rules of comedy and the threes and landing, all that stuff. It's such a science. It's, it's, it's definitely closer to music. I would say like, cause there's a real rhythm. Like when I did two and a half men, it's like, you know, it's not just set up, set up joke, but it, it's close to that. Yes. And, you know, and you have to understand where, because the writers are definitely hearing those rhythms. And if you don't adhere to them, you feel like you're not in the same band or something. You know, yeah. Not to torture the analogy. Well, how does that work on a, a, a sitcom? Isn't it like um, uh, something like three days of rehearsal and then they tape in front of a studio audience? Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. So you go in on Monday at 11 o'clock and you read the script and the script is only 25 pages. And I, I got tipped off to this because I had never done a sitcom until Two and a Half Men. <laughs> There's a hundred people there. Like, this is not like a read through, like, like with your friends, like doing a table read of a movie or something. It's like, there's a hundred people there. The head of Warner Brothers, 
uh, one of the high ranking CBS guys, the whole writing staff, the whole cast, the big part of the crew. I mean, it's like a hundred people and Impressive. they're not looking for you to like say the line like, and, and be okay. They're looking for what you're, you're going to do on the Friday night, four days from now, when we have the camera on, they want to hear if the line's funny right now. So it's right now. really a high pressure reading. And if you get through that table read and you get laughs, you're on your way because then it's Tuesday, Tuesday, you rehearse for like two hours, Wednesday you rehearse for like seven hours. And then Thursday, usually they shoot a few scenes. So it's like a 10 hour day. But I, I guess I'm saying all this because compared to like hour long TV, uh, which is 12 hour to 14 hour days every day, the sitcom life is the life because you work three weeks on one week off. If it hits, you make a boatload of money. And you know, it's just, and I really do love the fact that it's on a schedule. We're going to do this show Friday night at six 30. We're going to be done at eight 45. And anybody that keeps us from getting done by eight 45 is fired. Oh yeah. But now there, some of these sitcoms do go into overtime, right? So if a joke isn't landing, they're rewriting things in the spot in front of the audience. Who's like the, they full of pizza. They're, they're feeding yeah. them pizza to keep them interested and all that. I think so. Yeah. But I think like a two and a half men, I came in in the 11th year. It was already a well-oiled machine. Yeah. And, but I think these sitcoms in the first year, I think if they start going to like 10, 30, 11 at night, those, they don't last long. That, that, <laughs> it's not the business model. They just don't want to be paying lighting guys to stand around for 14 hours. You know, they, they want to get in and get out. Yeah. I had sitcoms that were kind of what hooked me on, you know, watching television as a young man, Jack Tripper, three's company, seen every episode a million times. It was like, God, I wish I can pull Love that it. off. It's I want to get one. It's the yeah. best job in the business. <laughs> so are you kind of focusing on that a little bit? Well, it's hard Trying to get one as many as they used to, you know, yeah. and, and uh, it's all single camera now where it's yeah. like Modern family. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, that's also, you know, that's a skill, but it's, I, I think that the visual aspect of those shows, doesn't make them any funnier. I think standing like from the honeymooners, which is my all time favorite, you know, it, where it, that set, if you look at the sets and the honeymooners there, it's a joke and they could have made it better because that's the same era as, you know, uh, the searchers, you know, like in terms of like set design and, and construction and stuff, yeah. they could have, and Jackie Gleason was the biggest guy on TV. So if they wanted that set to be better, they could have made it better. But Jackie Gleason, I think understood it's funnier that you know, he's standing in front of a friggin' plywood flat, and he's doing, you know, and it's him and Art Carney and they're just banging it back and forth. And so I think that really adds to it that there's less visual interest. I got to revisit the honeymooners. Go ahead, Jim. You've been something on your lips. You're, you're ready. They're, the thing about acting, I, I think, was it maybe one of the episodes that you and I had done where they talked about if you can do your lines, you know, in the middle of the sentence, pick up a glass of water and take a drink and then keep on going with it. That's when you know you're good. Is that mm. something that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what comes from having it, those lines so ingrained in your mind that, you know, if maybe somebody drops, you know, maybe the other character like bangs his coffee mug on the table and then you can register the coffee mug and give him a dirty look and still drive through. And, you know, and, and you know, it, all that little stuff, that's where, yeah. to me, that's where the acting is. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be a music kiss ass here, but I'm a big music fan. Sure. And I heard something from Bob Dylan that always stuck with me. And, and so I always like wait for it. I, I feel like, you know, my part of it is you like set the table, but Bob Dylan was saying in this interview that he often leaves in the mistakes from his takes because the perfection is not as interesting as the, it's going great. It's going great. And then there's a sour note or not a sour note, but a slightly off note. Yeah. So I just always thought as an actor, you know, I welcome that, you know, if, yeah. if the other person is a little erratic or a little weird, that's the truth of the scene. That's, you know, that's what's going on. It's loud outside. It's that's, that's the scene we're in. You know, it's funny because I think that's why a lot of the, you know, as we all know here, I'm a huge Marvel fan. Uh, and those movies are very, I feel like there's a lot of improvisation that goes on in those scenes. And that's what makes them so much more special. And there's an authenticity to them that actually comes through, you know. Yeah, I'd love to get on one of those just for the checks, if nothing else. But, uh, you know, I, I knew Robert Downey Jr. back uh, back in the day. I haven't seen him in many years. But I think I think that's his contribution to that franchise that whole model because he's such a skilled and adept ad liver he's a very funny guy and i think they saw how much he elevated iron man i mean because before iron man these kinds of movies really kind of sucked i mean you go back and look at superman with christopher reeve or even right up through the more recent ones you know michael keaton batman's okay but they're, they're all kind of like whatever two-dimensional they're a little flat but then the, that that iron man was a whole nother level of like he was wow, human it's giving them everything they need, but also you feel like he's making it up as he goes along in a good way. Yeah. I yeah. agree. There's an authenticity there that, that people can relate to. And I think all of their heroes, you know, they're not, they're, there's a gray area, 
with all their heroes. And it makes sense for this culture right now. Like yeah. what you're talking about with Christopher Reeve back, you know, he was too perfect to, right. you know, they, you know, and that's, that, that was the a Superman hair. character. But even right. look at, look at how that character has evolved. Look at the Henry Cavill version <laughs> of Superman. He is a flawed character. Yeah. And it's amazing yep. how that's kind of trend arced, you know? Yeah. For sure. Well, you know what, DB, you took, you know, lessons, you studied your craft and uh, sponsor of our show is this great thing called School of Rock. I'm sure they got them into the Chicago area. They got them all over. There's 250 locations. They're the sponsor of our show. Two of the best are right here in Nashville. Um, there's one in Nashville. There's one in Franklin. There's one coming in Mount Juliet. But our friends, Angie and Kelly McCright, they run this amazing program. Jim, aren't they not the best? I mean, they're for they 10 are. years they're cranking out great musicians. These kids are learning bass, guitar, keyboards, drums, how to sing, how to front a band. and But really, they're learning life skills, how to show up on time, how to set goals, how to work well as part of a team, how to take direction. And even if they don't become professional musicians, they're going to take those skills with them in life. So parents out there, you want to get your kids involved in the School of Rock. Here in Nashville, the kids are all sanitized. They're all masked up. They're playing music from ABBA to Zappa. They're performing it live. It's a great thing to get your kids involved in jim how do we get in touch with them franklin at school of rock.com and nashville at school of rock.com see see why i keep them around db that those pipes awesome hey i gotta Thank tell you. you a school of rock story so i yeah. did a couple years ago called uh captive state which was uh you know about alien invasion kind of movie yeah and i got hired to be a cop john goodman's in it and i had to sing so i had to sing uh um the old Eng engelbert humperdinck song uh, quando, quando, quando. Oh, and, yeah. And it was kind of a cool scene. Like, I was a cop, and it was a retirement party, and I'm singing. But I had never really sung in a movie. So, I mean, I sang with Charlie Sheen, uh, James Brown, drunk song once. But that was I was too young to really care that it was forever. Yeah. Uh, this time, I was like, wow, I'm singing in this movie. So, I went to School of Rock, and I hired a woman named Mimi Mapes here in Chicago. Wow. And we had five or six sessions, and she gave me great confidence, and we worked very technically on the song and worked on other songs. And... So I spent some time around School of Rock, and that's a really good organization, and uh, and I'm grateful to them. Unfortunately, they cut the song out of the movie, but ah. I still, I, so I still have my debut singing to uh, to occur. But I'm ready with Quando 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 if anybody wants to hire me to sing it. <laughs> that is hilarious, because and and that is amazing, because you know I feel like. Um, I don't feel like you've been typecast because that can really kind of be a thing. It happens to drummers, you know, all sorts of musicians, producers, songwriter friends of mine. Oh, he's writing that same song again. But yeah, it's working. But I mean, you've been in action films, thrillers, sports films, comedic things, and then on television, comedic and dramatic things. I mean, you probably play a lot of cops and detectives. I mean, not, you know, not as many as I would think. Like all my yeah. friends from New York that I grew up with became firemen or cops or went in the military. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And I would, I've never played a fireman, which is crazy because oh, I think wow. I was born to be. But yeah, I've played a few cops, but never a uniform cop, except one time I played, a, I did this movie with Courtney Cox where I played like a small town sheriff. Um, so, you know, but I, I, yeah, it's it's right there for me. I mean, I'm, I'm excited if I can find a, a like a supervisor cop role. I think I'd be perfect for that. But uh, it's, you know, it's been really, uh, you know, an interesting journey. And I'll tell you a story about typecasting, how stupid I was when I started out. My third or fourth movie was Eight Men Out. And as soon as we finished Eight Men Out, I played Shoeless Joe Jackson. And I thought, here's a chance to pay off my baseball roots. And right after it was over, they asked me to do Field of Dreams and play Shoeless Joe Jackson in that movie. And I was so worried about being typecast as a baseball player that I said, no, I can't do it. And I, I, it's such a great movie. I wish I had said oh yes. My gosh. But I think <sighs> typecasting is something you only have to worry about in the beginning. Because as soon as you do something different, then you're sort of free. You know, So I, I guess I had enough variety early but that was my stupidity then. I thought like they're going to think he can only play baseball players or something. So that was kind of dumb. But, you know, it is a real thing for young young actors, I think, when you're starting out. You know, if you, you don't want to exactly repeat yourself on the first couple because if, if they're big hits, you're fine anyway. But if, if they're not big hits, you're not going to really have the kind of tape you need to break through on that second wave of your career. Yeah. Well, wow. I mean, well, you've been at it for so long, man. If you look at the wiki or the IMDb, you, you know, you're starting things off and the cutting edge in 92. And what I loved about that was it had those workout montages. It, it, you know, it was just the like Rocky training montages with the 80s music and the DX7 synthesizer. 
And then, but then you're right off into Fire in the Sky, which I remember seeing and Lonesome Dove and Memphis Bell and Eight Men Out. And, it's, and it's, you just keep going. And then you're at Spawn and then you're in Liam Neeson move Taken 2, Heist with De Niro. I mean, this is to be celebrated, man. Well, you know, I'm very blessed. I, I feel like I never say I'm lucky because I feel like I earned it. I worked really hard, but I do feel blessed and fortunate. And, uh, you know, and I've, I've been working really hard and I, I feel like I've gotten even better at it the last few years where when they hire me, I feel like I'm really bringing value. And so I, I, I just love going to the set. I love working on a new project. I love getting a new character. Um, so it's, I hope it goes on, you know, but I treat every job. I, I definitely know, especially this COVID is the longest break I've ever had in my career, which, you know, six months, I, I, I started thinking, wow, I've, for 35 years, I've never gone six months without a job. And mm -hmm. so that's a great blessing. But at the same time, it makes me realize how precious it is. You know, like the next job I get, whatever it is, I'm, I'm going to really relish it even more. Yeah. Just, just do voiceover, man. You do it right from your home. Oh, man, mm -hmm. I wish. I, it's just, you know, I, mean, I don't know if you're getting this, but, you know, they, a lot of emphasis on diversity and they want female, they want younger. So I thought when I was in my 50s, I was going to be the next Don LaFontaine and I just sit in my chair and <laughs> knock it out. But I, it's not, that's not. That's not the, the sound they were looking for 20 years ago is not necessarily, I'm sure you're dealing with this too, the sound that they want now. I'm more of a promo voice. I mean, I'm, I'm the guy who reads stuff for, you know, presents. I do intro yeah. and outros for podcasts and radio and stuff. That's a great business. It, it can be. Radio is kind of... Yeah. I, have, I have my little voiceover demo. I don't know where I sit, but I have a little demo, you know. That's something. Doing, you know, doing the things. But I mean, you're, you've been voicing a mountain man on the History Channel, right? For like eight years? Yeah. It says we just got picked up for our 10th season. So, Great. Uh, so I'm actually going to go up to Montana in a couple of weeks and visit uh, the, the producers and the guys. I may go meet uh, one of the guys on the show. And I told them if we ever got to 10 years, I'm coming up. So they called my bluff. And uh, that's been great. I love that show. And when I first uh, read it, I was like, this is not a show I would watch. But I've gotten so addicted to these guys. And initially, I thought I had this idea about it that it's like, okay, you got these four guys living off the grid. They're kind of like, you know, gruff, renegade type people. Yeah. And I said, what if the what if the narrator was like the fifth mountain man? And that's kind of an out of the box kind of idea in narration. And they went for it. So I, it kind of gave this show a sound where I'm, it's not really my voice. It's kind of like this character, you know, it's yeah. like, coming up next on mountain man. You know, it's, it's a pushed, <laughs> exaggerated thing. And I have so much fun doing those episodes now because, you know, we're going through new characters or being introduced every year or so. And I hope that thing goes for another 10 years. I love doing them. And that's great. And do you do those, the, the, the voicing remotely or do you have to go to Burbank or like, how does that all work? Well, I, yeah, this is one client. I, I could do it at home and in a pinch I would, but they, they like, and I always prefer to go to a studio because, you know, I, I like to, you know, take all that stuff out of my hands, let a professional set the levels, do everything. So I can just focus on the sound. And, and on that show, we've always done a studio. So I go to a great place downtown Chicago called BAM Studios. Nice. And I have the best engineer, Matt Soro. He's unbelievable. And he, you know, he knows, it's like, he, he can tell me like, he knows my sound so well that he's like, Hey, you might want to go drink a little tea, man. You're a little rougher than usual. Cause I want to push it into this roughness, but he's got, you know, he's got great ears. So I've been very blessed to have him. Oh, nice. Oh. I, I think I would always prefer that too, because, you know, in, in the music business, we're, we're making music now a lot with our, you know, individuals in a small space. So a drummer's all mic'd up and he sends his files to a guitar player. And those people could be in different cities or different countries and they piece it all together, but it doesn't quite always have the same, you know, zest and yeah. essence as a bunch of guys playing in the room at the same time. The, the, the guy that I've been playing with for 20 years, Jason Aldean, he's had the same band for 20 years and with same guys playing on all the records. And we're like Aquaman and the fish and we're inside each other's brains and we're all on the studio floor at the same time. I hope that never goes away, but it, it really is being affected. We're going to that place now. I'm a big Go. fan, by the way. I don't want to, I don't oh, want to cool. speak out too much, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. You know, I, I, I was actually in Nashville this weekend. I, uh, what? Uh, oh, yeah. buddy, uh, uh, Jay DeMarcus is a buddy of mine. And so I, I went and did, uh, his reality show, DeMarcus Family Rules. I didn't know that. That is so crazy because yeah. two weeks ago I was at DeMarcus' studio because we were doing, uh, the Flats are doing a kind of like a duets record. And so they're picking all of their favorite <clears throat> people to sing songs with. So my boss, Jason, was like, hey, um, I think they're using studio musicians on this entire record. But not for our song. I'm using my band. And That's so awesome. I, was over, I was over at Jay's house two weeks ago. Isn't that a great studio? He's got... He's got the, the vocal booth and then he's got the powers booth, which I think is just so funny that one of my favorite actors of all time and he's got his own booth named after him. 
that's so, crazy. I don't think Jay even knew him, but it's just love, he loved the idea of putting that on there. That's funny. Jay's got a new band. Uh, Jim, you love this with Dean Castronova, one of your favorite rock drummers. Oh, really? Yeah, and I don't know if they're all singing. I mean, he just uh, Dean's drumming enough is 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 enough oh, to turn heads. I can't so remember awesome. the name of the guy. Who's the the singer from Chicago is in it? I think, <laughs> but it's kind of like our eighties eighties rock superstar band kind of. You know, you're not awful. sure if it's Peter Cetera. No, it's, it's not. not him, um, I know no, that. Name. No, because Jason was with Chicago for like twenty years. Uh, Jason, I'm going to tell you. I mean, right. Cetera is the Jason the, Chef. Yeah. So Terra's right. like the the keynote sound of that band, you know. That was what he was on the. All I think the when hits. they recorded the albums, he was the guy. But I think for the last twenty five years of touring, it's been the other guy. Jason, isn't that crazy? Tell me, you know, we, we had um, Paul Ben Victor on yesterday, and he talked about uh, working with De Niro and Pacino and stuff like that. And um, he, you know, as big of an actor as as Paul is, he says that you know they're on the set. Right there, you know, is he and Ray Romano? And he's like, you know, it's Ray Romano who is huge and just as on himself. But both of them looking at Pacino and De Niro like, there they are. You know, they're right there. Is that <laughs> kind of the same effect that you had with uh, working with them? Well, you know, I, I didn't get it. They cut out my scene. I had one scene with De Niro. The movie I did, Heist, uh, I played oh. the bus driver. And I, you know. They I, cut it out? Yeah. They, cut oh. it. Well, they, they, didn't, they didn't shoot it. They didn't oh. shoot it. So, but it was kind of, I play the bus driver and the bus is hijacked. And then at the end of the bus, he comes on, you know, and it was, it was a funny scene, but I guess at that point in the movie, they felt like it had to stay more scary and serious and thrillery. So that was fine. But, you know, I worked with uh, Robert Duvall and Tommy Lee Jones in uh, Lonesome Dove. And, you know, I felt like, Excellent. you know, I was early in my career, but I, I sort of knew what it meant to be working with Robert Duvall already at that point. And I did a Broadway play with Ed Harris that I got fired from, but I got fired because I was too old. I was his son. And we were like seven years apart and they were like, dude, we got to get somebody younger. So it wasn't like fired on the merits. It was fired for real, but we stayed friends. And then he did a cameo in my movie, two tickets to paradise. So to me, Robert Duvall and Ed Harris are the two greatest living American actors. And I've gotten to know them both and, and work with them. And so that, yeah, there is a, there's definitely is a, a I wouldn't call it a reverence, but it's sort of like, you know, you, you know that today or this week, or when I got this guy, you got to show up because he, if the scene doesn't work, it ain't his fault. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to blame him. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a, that's a, Ed Harris is one of my favorites. He was always just an Amazing intense actor. actor. Heist, I'm I'm looking at it right now. You got you got Jeffrey Dean Anderson in there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and we had Morris Chestnut, who's a great actor that I've worked with a few times, and uh, yeah. that was a really really good cast. And and uh, it, it's a really it's a good movie. It's like totally a B movie. You know, it's a, a, a casino robbery movie that turns into a hijack movie and. <laughs> but I told the bus, it's it's like a $20 million movie, but I think they gave $7 million to De Niro. So it's not really like a big budget movie. So they didn't have a, a stunt double that looked like me. So I volunteered to drive the bus. So all through this movie, I'm driving through Mobile, Alabama. And they said, all right, do you know how to drive a bus? And I had never driven one, but I just thought, how hard could yes. it be? Look at oh the people my who drive such buses, right? So they said, well, do you have a license? I said, oh, yeah, I got a class one. I'm rated for... Oh, uh, you know, anything up to 34 feet. I was just making the stuff up. And I thought they'd call my bluff on it. I don't even think they'd make a class Oh, one. my God. I don't even know. I just, I was just saying what it is. I don't know. It's just, uh, so, and, and they went for it. So, you, when you see that movie, like, I'm driving in a lot of these shots. And so, then they set up this one shot where it was a drone shot. We're going over the causeway just outside of Mobile, Alabama on the 10 freeway. Yeah. And, and it, it's like, we go over water and it's kind of a, with this bus is turning to the right and it's been hijacked. So we got the camera on the bus with the crew and all the cast and everybody. And then we got a drone camera coming at us, you know, at like 50 miles an hour. So the bus is going 50 miles an hour. The drone's coming 50 miles an hour. I'm driving this bus and we've been driving, doing night shots where there's no crowd control. Like the bars are opening and people are spilling out in the streets and there's no lockup. And it's like, I'm like hitting the brakes, trying not to run over drunks. So it's a very loose shoot in a kind of a cool way. But no kidding. Now, now we're on the causeway. And I start thinking, wait a second, if this guy doing the drone, if they got him like for a good price and he kind of sucks and this drone comes in 10 feet low, it's coming right through the windshield. And not only am I dead, I'm the guy that took the bus with Jeffrey Dean Morgan and, and Dave Bautista and everybody off into the water of the causeway. So not only am I dead, I'm the dead douche. So oh. I'm thinking, how, what am I going to do to – so I started – but I didn't want anybody else to drive because I thought it was such a cool shot. I wanted it to be me. So it's an old school bus where it has that cash box – you know, yeah. right next to you. Oh, so yeah. I started I'm practicing. We did the rehearsal. I practiced putting my left foot on the accelerator and my left hand on the steering wheel with my right foot down one step so that if the if the thing came in too low and went through the windshield, 
I was going to get behind the cash box. So I had to have an exit strategy just so I didn't become the douche who killed Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Dave <laughs> Bautista. I just can't, man, did, did, did they find out afterwards that you were, that, that you didn't have your license? Only if they see your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's brave. It has to furnish life. proof already. <laughs> yeah, I got one of the class F uh, licenses. You yeah. know, it's up to 38 and a half feet, I think. You know. I mean, that's crazy. Oh, my God. Well, you, 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 you write and direct and produce as well on the other side of the camera. Tell us about this new thing you got, your short film with Sean Astin. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Sean Astin, I did uh, Memphis Bell with him back in 1989, which is one of the last movies where they use actual airplanes in a movie. We had six B-17s and 13 Messerschmitt fighter planes and two camera planes. It was like an old school Hollywood war movie, and it was great. And Sean and I got along great. And I thought, well, we'll work together again. We're buddies and everything. And it never happened. So about two years ago, I bumped into him and I was like, Sean, we got to do something. He was like, let's do it. So I wrote this thing called Two Dumb Mix, which is uh, an homage to Abbott and Costello, which I grew up on and love. And I love the Marx Brothers and, you know, and uh, the Three Stooges, Little Rascals. Yeah. All that stuff is like my favorite stuff. Yeah. So I, wrote, I tried to write something for me and Sean in that vein, and we just shot it. And then I didn't, know what, I didn't know if it was funny or not, so I submitted it in some film festivals because I was too cheap to pay a market research company to, to test it or whatever. And so it, it's a one over 50 awards and film festivals as a short film and, and the other film festivals just say, we want to play your movie. And so it's, it's had a great run on the film festival circuit and we're trying to figure out what to do with it. Like whether it's a longer form uh, sitcom or whether it's a movie, I don't know, but I, I really want to do something with that and we just don't know what's going to happen yet, but it's, it's really been a fun ride. And if people want to watch it, it's at two dumb there's no B in the word dumb because they're dumb. It's too dumb mix. I, I, I watched it, right? I, th I think I watched the right one. They're in the prison cell and they go no, out and they want the pate. They want the, and he's like, no, it's not duck pate. It's, it's goose pate. Same thing. And so then at the end when the credits rolling says no, you know, birds or goo were geese were hermed in the make. What did, did you use a real goose or how did you get those shots? Well, we did. I, I, I was trying to, you know, we didn't have, I paid for the whole thing. So it wasn't like a big budget thing. It was a crew of 10 and me and Sean yeah. and, so I, I knew I needed a mechanical bird to, you know, to shit on him. So that's a, that's a, a mock-up. And then I went to a taxidermist and I got a stuffed goose and I said to the guy, listen, I don't know if I'm going to be able to bring this back exactly how it is. What, what is this thing going to cost if I, if I ruin it? And he was like 400 bucks. I was like, okay, well that's 400 bucks gone. So <laughs> uh, it was a hundred dollar rental with a $300 deposit. So, and I brought it back and I got the deposit back. I couldn't believe it. But anyway, the, the, the geese that are chasing us, our live action geese in LA. We just went in the park with no permit and just, I had three of my stunt guy buddies basically chasing the geese into the shots. And we just tried to, you know, film it as, as we could, you know, uh, with that. And then, and there's one shot where the goose chases us and that is computer generated. A friend of mine was good enough to uh, generate that one goose. And when we're struggling with the goose, it's a stuffed goose, but they just animated a little bit. So it's kind of like a combination of like old school props oh. and a little bit of, enhancement digitally i didn't notice any cgi because when i know it's cgi and sometimes i'm like eh, that's why i love ridley scott's alien because it's all dudes in suits dripping in ky and models and all that kind of stuff you know when it gets too cgi oh, I'm, but you yeah, can like tell you, you can tell comedy too, it takes you right out of it in comedy yeah but it's, you know so we had to keep it really subtle so do you need a permit to do like to do like or is it a, more of like when you go to the park is it a gorilla shot like we got to get this Yeah it's a big risk in LA because Sean was on board with it but a permit in LA to film is like $1000 a week we were going to film one day and then that's just a filming permit and then you're supposed to have two cops there who are retired police officers with their LA motorcycles you got to pay these guys 38 bucks an hour two guys to just sit there and we're like there's 10 of us we're in a park we're not doing anything wrong so I was like, you know what, we're going gonzo. And we, I just had three parks uh, picked out where we could film. And I was like, okay, if we get chased out of this one, I just, I knew we wouldn't get arrested because one of the cops would say, oh, you're the dude from Fire in the Sky or hey, here's Rudy or what, I knew we'd be all right in that regard. <laughs> but I, I also knew we'd have to go to another park. So I, my location scouting was like, okay, here's the best park. Here's the second best park. Here's the third. And they had to be close so we could move everybody and keep filming. But we didn't get kicked out. We just, you know, we, uh, one guy came by at one point. He was like, what are you doing? And this is, I think, the best part of it. My agent's name is Eric Seastrand. His son's name is Drake. Drake Seastrand, right? So we had a small enough crew, and Drake's 12 years old. So we taught Drake that if a cop comes over, say, these are my dad's friends. I'm doing a school project. It's about my origin story because my name's Drake, 
we're making a little movie about ducks. And he had this whole thing worked out. But anyway, <laughs> they never, we never had to deploy it. But, so that's why Drake's thanked at the end of the movie. That was my permit. It was Drake Seastrand. Wow. Okay, what well, was it, like uh, parks over in like North Hollywood or something? Or yeah, like, like Balboa Park. Oh, movie. yeah. Yeah. So, wow. Pretty fun. You want to make sure they get in theirs. Yeah. That, I don't yeah, think they'll be able to film there now if they're watching. <laughs> well, hey, but th- I am learning so much. We're going to take a quick break and be right back. Learn by doing, I definitely think, resonates with what we're about here at the School of Rock. I'm Angie McCright, and I'm the owner of the School of Rock in Franklin and Nashville. I would say that the majority of kids that come in have either been sitting in their bedrooms watching YouTube, learning how to play, or they've taken music lessons at some point in their life. We do have a lot of beginners. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You can participate in our programs, whether you're a beginner or you're advanced. We don't teach music to put on shows. We put on shows to teach music. Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. What do you got coming up? You got some uh, interesting things in the pipeline? Well, we're still doing, uh, closing out the festival run with Two Dumb Mix, and uh, it's just amazing now we're up to I think it's won 60 awards or something like that, which is crazy because you know, it was just fun with me and Sean out there and, and uh, you know, messing around with ducks and geese. And so it's, that's been great. And I have another movie called uh, Manson Brothers Midnight Zombie Massacre. Yeah, and I heard about this. What is this? It is a wrestling movie that morphs into a zombie movie. So pretty much two of the basic movie food groups um, that everybody <laughs> needs. Wow. So, uh, you know, I, I, they had me at zombie. I'd never done a zombie movie. I was like, I love zombie. Great. I've seen them all. I've seen them in different yeah. languages. There's no end to the appetite for zombies. And uh, the two guys who wrote it, um, MJ Carey and, and Chris Mar- Margatis, were, they were both actually wrestlers. You know, not like WWE, but 25 years ago, there was an actual wrestling circuit where, I don't know, maybe even in Franklin, Tennessee, they go into a high school gym and 200 people come in and it's a little bit like that characters and fake wrestling, but real wrestling. And so anyway, these guys actually did that. And Mike, MJ, Mike is a, is a great guy. He's a former Chicago fireman. He's a, a former Marine. He's a, there's no former Marines. He's a U.S. retired Marine. And, uh, and anyway, he and I got to be friends on this movie, Shy Rack, that I did for Spike Lee here in Chicago. And we just stayed in touch. And he put together the money. And, he made, and I was like, you know what? I want to I help this guy, whether it works or not, because he's an entrepreneur. And then he got Max Martini, who's a buddy of mine, who, an actor who's coming and direct it. And Randy Couture's in it, and uh, Jada Marcus has a cameo in it, and oh, wow. uh, Jonathan Sheck, and uh, just a bunch of people. Like, and it's just a big, stupid mess of fun. It's it's like the ultimate midnight movie. Like, you know, back in the day, you know, you just you see this one in a drive-in, everybody would have a doobie, and you just you know, it's, <laughs> it's that movie. And so, so I'm, is it done? Is it done? Done. It's done. Yeah, they're just trying to figure out if it's going to come out in December or January. It's going to be video on demand. You know, the world we live in. It's like theaters were always a problem for movies in the last five, 10 years, just economically. Yeah. But now with, you know, 25% capacity in a theater, you know, even if you have a hit, you don't make money. Yeah. Plus I don't want to be in the theater. I'm just that guy. I don't want to be in a theater of someone sneezing. Yeah. And then you're, then it's like all the part. Ah, and I'll stay at home. Uh, VOD. I went, I went to see Tenant, the new Christopher Nolan movie uh, in IMAX last week. That was my first time back. And that's definitely worth going out to see because it's a big screen experience and everything. But a movie like Manson Brothers Midnight Zombie Massacre is going to be so much better on your couch because you can pause it and play it back. And it's, it's just – it's got a lot of little stupidity uh, elements that I think are going to really bear well re-watching. Oh, my God. I you love think it. Holly, Hollywood will ever go direct to streaming with movies of that at some point and it's kind of bypassed them? Or can they do Yeah, that? I think it's going to happen if yeah. not this year, next year at the latest. And I think the movies are going to only be like Christopher Nolan and Marvel. And yeah. Pixar and you know yeah, and you, anything you're spend less- 60 bucks or, or whatever and the whole family sits on the couch and that's what you'd spend normally yeah and I think I think they'll find more creative ways to do that like we mentioned the whole family like for Pixar and the Disney model it's going to be like okay it's $99 but you get a pizza you get four drinks you get this you get that you get you know yeah. and so that's just buy one, we'll swipe your card one time and come see it and 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 I think with the Christopher Nolan and the Marvel type movies it's going to be like Alamo Draft House where 99 bucks, you get everybody, you get three tickets and three drinks each and a ball of popcorn. And so it's more adult beverage oriented. And, yeah. and I think that's the only way that that can survive because 
you know, the TVs at home have gotten so good. I mean, you know, yeah. you can get a TV for 70 bucks. I mean, 700 bucks. That's, you know, like a, a TV that would have cost $20,000 yeah. 15 years ago. It's like a wall. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. So that's going to just really disrupt uh, theater owners. That's going to be very interesting. They're going to have to rethink their whole business model. And I think yeah. Alamo draft house is going to be the survivor. And I think that, AMC and those other theaters are going to have to figure out a way to do that. Cause I don't think it's about comfy chairs. I think it's about making it a night out. Yeah. And, and so I think that it's gotta be adult beverages. It's gotta be like, we've got the best wings we've got, you know, it's going to have to become more like it's a bar room experience. Not exactly, but you know, maybe you have a bar outside, you know, arc light theaters is doing this more and more too, but to make money at it, they're charging so much money that I, they got to find a way to do it where like my son's 19 years old. He's a freshman in college and, he has no interest in going to the movies because hmm. it's just too much money. And, yeah. and so like, if you, you know, the, we went to the drive-in when I was growing up, it would be like five bucks a car load. We'd yeah. have 12 people inside that car and a case of beer hidden under a blanket. And it was like, it made sense. But you know, if, if, if you're charging people $12 for a ticket, seven bucks for a Coke, I mean, you've lost the people that you make Marvel movies for are like 18 to 30 or 15, 30. They don't have that kind of money. And Jim. And Jim. <laughs> If if you had if if like these car mics and big theater groups, they should really be buying up plots of land and bring back the drive-in. Yeah, the drive-in would... had a big summer. Uh, the drive, the whole genre, I think, was down to like sixty drive-ins in America, and, mm -hmm. and that's I think tripled during COVID. So wow. I could come back. I think that drive-ins are a great experience. And now, uh, same thing with car systems, uh, with home entertainment systems, like the the car stereo that you're playing the movie soundtrack through is Dolby or it's, you know, or it's, you know, it's great sound. So you sit here and you watch this movie outside with a theater kind of experience right in your car. Yeah. yeah. I remember the seventies. I mean, I was born in seventies. So I saw star Wars in the theaters. I saw Jaws in the theaters, close encounters, ET. It was like a heyday of, of film making. And you'd have to hook this little horrible speaker yeah. up on your, uh, so now it's like Bluetooth thing or something to your sound right. system in your car. A frequency you tune into a like a oh. they, have, they have like a local broadcast on a frequency like eighty seven point nine or whatever, and you tune it in on the FM band. Wow, you know, you yeah. And if you if you have a good sound system in your car, I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's the same kind of surround sound you'd get in a the theater. So, and of course, you can bring your own uh, materials and yep. in your car and not have to pay for them. That's true. Yeah, twenty twenty. Sure what you're talking about here? Twenty twenty <laughs> is the the year of absolute <laughs> disruption. I mean, wow. I mean, it's just a pivot year. I mean, all, all, everything that I do is, involves uh, being in a room with, with creative people. Like, so performing live, recording, uh, I do motivational speaking for Fortune 500 companies. You got to have someone there. That's all on Zoom now. Right. It, it's all. It's a, it, what a year. Well, wow. I'm looking forward to going back to normal. And, you know, I mean, I'm not, I don't know. I know this, that COVID is very deadly for old people or people with pre-existing conditions uh, that are breathing or immune system. But, I mean, the reality is if you look at the research, it's not that deadly. So, so hopefully we get through this election and then we can come back to normal. And, yeah. you know, because I love doing theater, live theater as an actor is my yeah. favorite thing. And, and I mean, that's that, that industry is in big trouble because the demographics for, for live theater is like uh, 60 to 80 and white, you know, like, yeah. so like, they, you know, they're not coming back. They're like, yeah. you know, you hear somebody cough in a play and people are going to run for the fire exits. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I, I don't know what they're going to do, but they, you know, I, hopefully we can just get to a point where it's like, okay, Everybody got this thing. Everybody's been exposed to it. And anybody who's not dead yet is probably not going to die from it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's, that's kind of my take on it as well. You know, I think after, I, I, I believe you're right. After November, it'll go away. Something else will take its place. Yeah. So. Well, you know, what's interesting is uh, when I think about you going back, uh, you started in theater and you probably do theater in between films to keep things sharp. Um, you know, the, the, when I take acting classes, it's always the th first thing is like, look, a TV and film is incredibly subtle and you don't have to be as broad and big and loud because you don't have to project. But isn't theater different now in the sense that you probably have a lapel mic so you can actually be smaller? Is yeah, that right? I don't really love that mic. You're right, though, 100%. Like in, in any kind of Broadway setting or any theater that's bigger than 150 seats, you're mic'd. And I don't like it because I feel like it. it's, you know, when you have a good – mixer and you have somebody who's on it in the right way it's okay but and I, you absolutely have to have it with music because the, the the singer can never overcome the band even if the band's recorded so the symbols yeah yeah so i mean they <laughs> yeah i mean they 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 need it in that regard but i like doing theater right like right in that 199 199 seats where it's a well-designed theater the acoustics are good 
And I feel like if you don't have a microphone on, it's a more of an athletic endeavor. Endeavor. You have to you have to generate air. You have to control your breathing. You have to be physical. I just feel like it's more alive and it's more electric. But you know, I I know that if I want to play in front of more than 199 people and actually make more than $700 a week, you got to put a microphone on. So I, I, I've resigned myself to it. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. Now, Jim, this yeah. is your favorite part of the show. The random question. Oh, of the day. I, 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 digre- I disagree. I think it's your favorite. I don't know. You, you, you created this thing, but we even wrote a jingle for it and everything. And it goes like this. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. Okay. DB question. Random day of the ready, ready. Would you rather be able to see 10 minutes into your own future or 10 minutes into the future of anyone but yourself? Oh, absolutely. Somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I know reason? what I'm going to do, but I don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> nice that's a good one i like that well that was easy usually yeah. the random it really our questions will trump people they will it'll mess them up yeah that was, well, easy. I was afraid it's gonna be something tricky like uh you know who's your prettiest actress you ever worked with or something where you can't say the wrong thing yeah <laughs> like a howard stern question right yeah that's Ooh, I, was, I, was, I was on the edge of my seat waiting for that <laughs> the tap out question we right. used to do that in radio yeah yeah. Have you have you been able to be be married through all this? Because it's just yeah, like well, a I got married late. I got married at thirty nine. You know, uh, uh, and I you know I never met the right girl. My wife was awesome. We have two great kids, nineteen and sixteen, and a boy and a girl. And uh, but if I had gotten married in my twenties or my thirties, I would have been divorced in ten months. You know, I, yeah. I sort of knew I wasn't ready for it. And and yeah. you know, I was traveling the world and working with these unbelievable people. And you know, I mean. I always say this, uh, actor, plus the only people you meet are actresses when you're working as an actor in early in my career. So there's four states of being for an actor in a relationship. Like if it's a, a two people that are actors, you're either both home and you're miserable because you're unemployed or one of you is away working with amazing people and the other one's home miserable because they're unemployed or vice versa, or yeah. you're both off somewhere with amazing people that aren't your spouse. So it's like all four states of being suck in an actor relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, you know, the whole thing of being on the road, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's hard on the person back home and it's hard on the person out. Yeah. I tried it. Yeah. I tried it twice already. It is. It's, it's an interesting thing to be in showbiz and crazy, but more importantly, how can people find you? DBSweeney.com and it's Sweeney is S W E E N E Y.com. And then I asked you if you'd like to be found on the internet with the socials. And it sounds like on Twitter and Instagram, you're at real DB Sweeney. That's me. And on Facebook, it's actor and director DB Sweeney. I love that. Right on. Cool, man. Well, this was so, so fun. Um, yeah. Did we, did we uh, cover what you had coming up? Oh yeah. The zombies, yeah. the, the two friends, the two mix. Yeah. Well, I know, I guess you won't be out on the road with, uh, with uh, Mr. Aldean anytime soon, but I'd love to come see you guys play. And, well, uh, we'll make know. that happen, man. We'll well, Chicago is a, is, a, is a wonderful town, and we always play, um, what is it, the, is it the Hollywood Casino Amphitheater yeah, out there? Yeah, down in uh, Orland Park. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. got rained out. It rained cats and dogs last time, and we had to cancel the show, and I don't think we made it up. Um, but, yeah, so we're due for a great Chicago experience again. That's awesome. Well, I'll look for you out there. Well, totally, man. We would really appreciate you coming by and chatting with us. And to all the listeners out there, uh, thank you guys so much. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, review. Leave us a review. Leave us five stars. It takes 30 seconds. If you love the show, if you hate the show, we want to hear from you. I got an email address for you, Show at gmail.com. Thanks to our sponsor, School of Rock. Keep coming back for the good stuff. See you next time. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.